Hello guys, Dieter here. Uh, finally, another interview uh, with somebody that I recently met. Um, he has a famous, one of the only craft beer bottle shops in Leuven. He lived in China longer than one year, he told me. He speaks Chinese and knows a lot about the Asian beer market. Welcome, Kuhn Kostermans. Thank, How are you doing? Thank you, Dieter. I'm doing very well, even though it's a second lockdown, but we try to survive and we try to make things as good as possible. Yeah, cheers on that. Um, tell me a bit, um, you lived in China for quite yeah. a time. Yeah, and... so, yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I traveled firstly, I traveled a couple of times to China before, and then in 2013, 2014, uh, for more or less like a year, I, I lived there. I worked there as a, as a, as a teacher teacher of English, a bit of economics, a bit of mathematics to especially high school and, and primary primary school because of because of my my family. I was there especially. It was not one of the main big cities like a lot of people probably will know Beijing or Shanghai or Hong Kong or maybe Xi'an. I was more in the center of China. It was still a big city, 25 million people, but less less international. It was a pretty, pretty cool experience. And afterwards, yeah, I still kept traveling back and forth, usually once or twice a year, if uh, if, if there's no corona, of course. Yeah. Is it in China that you discovered craft beer or about what year are we talking now? Yeah, more or less, uh, let's let's say during my studies, uh, that's then we're talking 10 years back in, when I was studying in Leuven, yeah, you drink some Trappist beer. Uh, yeah, you drink some Leffe and yeah, you drink the classics uh, because yeah. 10 years ago there was not that much craft beer yet in Belgium. But it actually, it really started when I was living in China because uh, if the Chinese already talked to me and they knew, ah, is it this guy is from Belgium, then they ask, ah, yeah, we know some Belgian brands. And then you talk, start talking about it. You show some passion. You show yeah. it's one of the few things like you have fries, you have, uh, you have chocolate. Uh, you have Tintin and then you have chocolate and then you have beer you can talk about if they already know Belgium. So that's, that's really fun. Uh, and that's a little bit how it started and I got more into it. And then when I came back, I started following up a little bit more about Belgian craft breweries, international craft breweries. Uh, had the luck to do a small, small world trip a couple of years ago. And, and even there in, in the different continents we visited, I also tried to from time to time, visit a, a local brewery, craft brewery, or local craft bars to really get in touch with the people. And it's, it's always been a, a fun, fun, uh, fun way to to meet people and to talk about to talk about your passion. It's still a hobby; it's a passion. So that's that's what makes it uh, makes it fun. Yeah, and th this year you decided, um, with your, of course, your day job, but also to start a bottle shop in uh, yeah. Yeah, it's it happened in actually in the first lockdown. It was mainly our good friend Yella, who was uh, also not working at that time because he has a more distribution job in beer, and then he was like, ah, maybe I could consider doing a, maybe a bottle shop. And he was always looking in in Brussels, but I said, look, Brussels already has a couple of bottle shops, nice ones, but Leuven there's nothing. Uh, Leuven is. Leuven always likes to call itself as like the beer city, the beer capital of, of Belgium. Okay, there's AB Inbev and there's Stella Artois everywhere, but there's almost no breweries. All bars all serve the same stuff. And being for craft, there was pretty much nothing. I always said to people, if you come to Leuven, just come to my home and I open my cellar and you can drink craft beer. So that's why we came up with the idea together. We checked a bit in places and then we found a very good location and then yeah, we just did it and it was quite fast uh, and a small investment together. We, we opened the shop and it's been going pretty well, actually. People like it. The, the Leuven has a quite also an international uh, uh, atmosphere from, from, the, from the university and from, from a lot of people who stay here after studying. It's not the biggest city of Belgium, but still there's quite a lot of people who are happy and are interested to learn new things. So we always try to have a nice variety, different breweries from different countries, not too expensive, not not too low. Of course, we need to make some money as well. It's a shop anyway, but it's it's really fun. It's really you get good feedback from, from the people. So that's the most important, of course, for us. And you have all uh, kinds of people like st or more students than in other bottle shops. Well, students, I think yeah, 
depends maybe a little bit. I mean, we started end of June and then this, yeah, the, the year was almost over. And then during the summer, most students are not in Leuven. And then when, when the, the academic year started again in, in, in September, almost a couple of weeks later, yeah, the, the lockdown happened again. So we had a couple students, but it's not like we had massive amount of students. I think maybe if we have a normal year, we really can start promoting ourselves. I think more and more students will get interested for sure even though it could be too expensive for them, but at least we always offer some some nice, cheaper beers or more cost-friendly for them, like from the La Seine or from more Brussels breweries, as long as it's it's interesting for them too. Yeah. And how did you uh, fill your, uh, your stock of beers? Was that, I like these brands and uh, financially they're interesting and then you buy them or you had some things, concepts in mind to mix them? Yeah, so yeah, we, uh, both Yellen and myself, I mean, we visited a lot of festivals before. We know which breweries we, we really like ourselves. We always said, okay, we have our two fridges, we have some shelf space. It's not a big shop, it's it's actually pretty small. So we had like, okay, let's say we can put around 150, 200 items. Uh, uh, we always want some Lambic because it's a Belgian tradition. We like it as well. We really want the Lambic for sure. And then, yeah, we started just by contacting some distributors in Belgium, then looking a bit, okay, you, you check untapped, you check, you check some reviews from other people, you check from what you drink yourself before from the same brewery, you're like, okay, okay maybe we can try this, especially IPAs, because that's the popular, popular style now, for sure, take some sours, take some stouts, to always have a good a good variety and what's i think what's what we felt already after some weeks is that yeah i always get some beers that's easy and not too expensive so a lot of people can buy it and then like the more rare ones or the limited ones yeah, you always have the the more beer fans who will come to the shop for that no matter the price so that's also good to know we don't need to buy too much of those but yeah we always can sell them anyway so that's we had a very good rotation of our stock so it's it's always fun if a person comes in and he says, ah, I've been here two weeks ago and I suddenly have the fridge is already different. So that's always nice to hear and they're always happy that they can see some some new stuff. Yeah. And your background is in finance, so I assume that you do all the, yeah. the finance business and the calculations of uh, Yeah, sort of yeah. Stuff. We have a pretty well, we it's a pretty easy concept. Yeah, you just take your margin you want. We have an Excel. We dump everything in there from 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 the from a purchase cost and then and then so it's pretty easy. It's not. It's, uh, luckily, it's not rocket science. So, so yeah, and 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 that's why yeah, that's the way we do it, and and that's what we when we started, we said okay, this is how we're gonna work. We, we take the margin, and then we will see how it how it works, how the cost will go, and and, and the cash flows will will be will be going. So. But like I said, after now four months, things are going well. Now we like to see to survive the lockdown, and then we, we like to grow again and well again. So yeah, things are looking looking pretty good. Yeah, okay, uh, tell me a bit. I mentioned in the introduction also um, your passion for uh, China. How did that come? Yeah, it's as as uh, how does it usually happen? Huh? You you met some somebody and. It happened when, when both of us were studying the same master at the KU Leuven. Well, they always call the KU Leuven the biggest cupid in the world, or maybe at least in Belgium, because it's true a lot of people meet meet uh, the loved ones at the university. So yeah, that's how it happened. And she's a Chinese, so and now she's my wife as well. So, And then at one point, you, you decide also to go there and to meet the family. And then at one point, I also decided to go there and live there. And that's why I also started studying Chinese, of course. It's nice when you go to another country, at least you can you can talk a bit to people and not like, yeah. I mean, in the very, very beginning, you go to a dinner and I can tell you Chinese dinners, it's not like, let's go somewhere, let's eat for half an hour and then let's go to a bar. No, it's a Chinese dinner is maybe 10, 15 people. They also will buy the drinks from outside of the restaurant, you bring your own drinks to the restaurant, it's fine there, it's okay. You bring your wine, your alcohol, your okay. beer, whatever you want, it's allowed. And then you eat for oh, two or three hours maybe. I can tell you if you're in the very beginning, you don't understand a little bit Chinese, then it's two, three boring hours, especially if the other ones cannot speak English. So that's why I said directly, okay, I'm gonna learn some Chinese so I can at least understand a little bit what they're talking about or at least a little bit, have a small discussion or a small chat. 
doesn't have to be very complicated, but at least uh, otherwise you're just the the happy foreigner sitting there nodding, yeah, yeah, smiling yeah, yeah. all the time. Uh, so. And uh, how many years did you study Chinese? Well, I, I finished uh, at 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 uh, CLT, which is from the from the KU Leuven. Uh, you have eight years you can do, and I finished those, and then I I kept doing them because yeah, it's it's a good way to to keep practicing or at least keep talking. For me, it's the most important. I can understand, I can talk to people, I can write a little bit, especially by, by phone. It's most important. And yeah, now with the lockdown, I mean, now with the COVID, I, I stopped it because I don't like like Zoom classes. I'm not a big fan of it, I like uh, in-person classes. But I, I have been doing it since uh, 2000, uh, 2011, I think. Yeah, and then it's once once a week, so it's pretty okay. But it's nice. It's slow. It's not like you learn Spanish or uh, another language, another easier language. But it's fun. It's uh, it's interesting. Uh, to zoom in a bit on that, the beer scene not the craft beer scene but the beer scene in china how is that i'm imagining that they have quite commercial lagers and a lot of commercial beers yeah. there and the go-to alcohol in china is beer and then you have a strange chinese uh, hard liquor probably. yeah so you have so actually the, the 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 amount of the number of brands is pretty limited uh, you have the the very big commercial ones like or like Harbin, which is from maybe Indem, I think you have Snow, which is a big one. And then probably in every province, you will also have a big one. Mm. And they all make the same lager, like around three, four percent. They sell them in half liters. It's just for, it's super cheap. So it's for everybody who goes to a restaurant and who doesn't want to drink strong alcohol. They will buy a beer and they just drink it by, by the half a liter. Just easy, fast. It's about fast drinking. The beer and then like you said you have baijiu which is translated white white alcohol which is around 50 to 60 percent the first times i tried it and the first time i smelled it i was like okay is this pure alcohol am i gonna be blind now but <laughs> it's it's a it's a very specific taste it's yeah of course it's very strong but it's yeah but it's a very very traditional uh chinese drink so if you again if you go to a dinner or they will order uh, maybe 24 bottles of beer. Even if they don't drink it, they will order it to show they can order it. But otherwise, usually they will have minimum two bottles of Baijiu, then it's to share, and then it's a, yeah, it's a custom to, to, to serve it to everybody. And then two, three times you do a toast and you, you drink your Baijiu. But yeah, it's, it's strong and it's, uh, it's special. I can only say that. So ever, if you ever can make it to China, you can try some, uh, some Baijiu. Sure, try it, but it's... Uh, it's an interesting experience. Uh, I tried it once in Belgium. Um, okay. Yeah. For the record, alcohol in China, beer and spirits in general, are quite cheap. Uh, I would say beer and then the commercial ones is very cheap. Um, then Baijiu, it really depends. I mean, you, you have the, the cheaper brands for, yeah, you always have people, you still have people there. There's a job, uh, an income equality inequality so you have always need the people who can buy with one or two euro can still buy their baijiu but it's a yeah, it's a it's just some crappy crappy brand but the, like motai is the most famous one and there you're talking about minimum prices of two three hundred euro for a bottle of 50 centiliters because it's a very yeah it's a very specific production process as well for the very good ones and you also have different yeah, like herbal tastes you can have in those in those baijios. So actually, that's why for for like like I said, it's a traditional drink, and then for like or even for the government or for for business, it's very important to show you can buy those very good brands of, of, of strong alcohol. Beer is really for going to a restaurant and have share with dinner, or going to a, a club or to a bar and just drink, drink, drink. That's the commercial the commercial beers. Yeah. Baijiu is more for family, for festival, family festivals, for holidays, for business, or or really for or like for a wedding. It's important to have Baijiu. Okay, it's really like a social symbol there to have yeah, it and show yeah. it and like yeah, really. Oh, like the Polish vodka. Yeah, really. <laughs> yeah, but it's 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 really important. If you don't have a Baijiu, let's say on a wedding, your wedding has failed for sure. <laughs> How many bottles of Baijiu did you collect uh, during your wedding? Uh, I, I, during my wedding in China, I, I didn't eat or drink a lot. It's funny, yeah. You're just 
going from table to table and yeah, or nodding and talking to get, talking to people. But that's what you do because the wedding only lasts for two or three hours. It's not like a European wedding. Oh. Like a, it's it's a day wedding. Eh? It's just lunchtime and then it's finished. So okay. people come, they eat, and then they go home. That's it. Okay. Okay. Cool. But you, as a host, you go to every table. You go say hi. You you share a, a small sip of bites or, or uh, wine or whatever. That's quite it's quite interesting. It was also fun. Uh, fun time how, how do the in general eh, the average chinese person look to beer drinking is there you mentioned a culture of very heavy drinking are chinese people like the more you can drink the more you're the man or it it you i would say especially with the first times i went to china and then i'm talking 2012 it, it really i felt that that was the way of drinking that was a drinking culture you would go to a bar which there are actually not that many bars in, in i would say back then in china now it's evolved a lot but back then it was more you could go to a, a club or like a, a ktv which is sort of karaoke but it's a it's with uh, private rooms and then they would order like i said you could order you were with maybe two or three or five people and they would order 24 bottles or if you would go to a uh, a bar you had those beer towers of three liters so it's from a from a it's from the keg and then you get five glasses and then they, they just pour it in the small in the small glasses and you play some you play some uh, some games and it, it's drinking games and it's just about fun and drinking and it's always bottoms up it's never about mm, am i am i mm, it's a nice shima if if i would be there and I say let's try something different so we, we would buy a duvel or a shima if, if the bar had it but they would drink it in the same way. It would be shimmy of, of 10 degrees. Okay, let's bottoms up. And because that's back then, that was their drinking culture. Yeah. But now, now these days, it's more evolved in... Uh... Yeah, yeah. It's a, yeah, especially since uh, everything from, from the, the craft beer evolution, I would say. It's really the last three to five years, especially the last three years, it really evolved a lot. And then you could see... Let's say that the typical drinking culture, it still exists. I mean, especially if you go to the more rural or the smaller cities or less developed cities, you will still find it. But in the very international or the bigger cities, you have more people who maybe went abroad, studied abroad, they come back, they have a more distinguished taste or, or they, 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 try, they like to try new stuff, international stuff. Uh, there's also maybe people who already got got to know wine and now they also got to know craft beer so they they look at it the same way with really tasting and try to accepting different flavors so that's how that that drinking culture really evolved um and then of course yeah the the market even though the, the beer market is big and it's, i think it's one of probably the biggest beer market in the world craft beer is still a very very small percentage but within that craft beer chinese craft beer market yeah it's been booming in massively and and from from a domestic viewpoint and from an import viewpoint it's it's actually been crazy you cannot imagine we we are here uh, we're europe and we're at the old continent and we we always look to other continents but the chinese they're they're evolving and and they're going so fast uh, in and in beer it's the same it's it's really crazy what happened in the last three years, especially. Yeah, yeah you're now tipping the craft scene in China. Um, how is that? You have your typical Western craft beer bars there, or you have more bottle shops, or you only have it in first tier cities, or? No, no, the, the, no. so actually, if, if you talk about the, the level of cities now at the first tier, and that's really like Beijing, Shanghai, but even in the, in the lower tier cities, you will already have now craft beer bars or craft beer bottle shops or a mix or tap rooms. Uh, a couple of years ago, it was especially the, the bars slash bottle shops happened. Then like two, three years ago, it really was popular to have like tap rooms. And if I, in China, they always like something to be big. So if it's a tap room, it's not 10 tops, it would be 30, 40, 50, 60 tops, just as long as you can show that you have many tops and many different beers. And in bottle shops, it's it's the same even now. And it even could be a, a super small location or it could be a very big location. They really want to have a very, very, very big selection of beers. And I'm talking big. It's not If we say maybe here a bar is nice, oh, they have 100 different types of Belgian beer. 
their bars they have 500 to 1000 different beers easily because yeah the import scene is is huge now plus you have a lot of domestic craft breweries popping up from from time to time in every big or small city so the so the supply for a bottle shop if i would be a bottle shop owner in china it's heaven it's really heaven because there is so much you can buy it's 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 you could name a lot of even famous american brands they already have it in china so and we don't have it in europe even uh, how, yeah, so that's how, that's how pretty interesting that, is that just the market supply and demand uh i am a chinese uh, craft beer fan here you have a lot of money ship a container of your product and it comes there but i think or... that that's of course that's one part of it i mean we're not going to be we're not going to be silly about it i mean european breweries or american breweries especially in america if you have seven thousand breweries or more at some points your local market is totally saturated so then you go looking to other markets and okay europe could be for an american brewing interesting market but we already have our own traditions and our own breweries and then you go to bigger countries or bigger areas and then the first one that pops up is china of course super big market you have a growing middle class who's interested in in craft beers who wants to spend the money um so there's there's really a lot of especially american breweries in the last three years trying to enter maybe sometimes it doesn't work out but yeah they keep grow, keep coming keep more and more even brands i never heard about in europe from i mean like american brands that we don't get here but they enter china very easily and they can become very popular actually and then it's if they really become popular then you're talking about yeah a container per month or could be even more yeah yeah thinking um expanding business in china i am always always worried about bureaucracy papers um import costs and yeah the rule of law that's main, well, not so favorable for somebody from out of china i would say are that real uh, it's no it's it's pretty okay actually i mean uh from my experience and i know a little bit because i helped a couple of belgian breweries especially for the export because i i have a friend who has an import company and we try to work a little bit together so i advise him about european breweries he already has been doing a lot of european breweries himself and then i got to know about the process too and it's actually pretty okay i mean you need some extra documentation like uh, origin because uh, they need to know where the where the product is coming from. Yeah. You need some specific characteristics of each beer. You need like the labels need to be ready and stuff like that. But the process itself is pretty okay. Yeah, sometimes it could be some specifics in a customs law that you that we as Europeans will think, hmm, what's this? Like they have this weird thing about fruit in beer. Sometimes it's 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 seen as okay, it's still beer. But sometimes they will see it. Ah, oh, no, this is not beer anymore, even though it's beer. They will say, "Ah, oh, no, this is a juice because there is fruit used in the beer." So that could be a bit different. But for the rest, it's it's pretty okay. And and um, yeah, the process itself, it's 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 quite fast. Okay, the transport takes some time. It's half of the world you have to travel, but the process is is pretty pretty easy. What I could say, let's say, what you what happens sometimes is is that yeah you you can tell that because that craft beer market is booming a lot you have a lot of new companies entering like new importers smaller importers or some importers who don't take the rules very nicely like a very very uh, classical example is actually it's one of the breweries that my friend imports with the molen it's very very famous he he made the molen quite big in in china it's still very popular there but at one point in time, I think now three years ago, there was another importer who apparently liked to register trademarks. So what did he do? He, re he registered a trademark of the Molen, both the name and the logo. Yeah. And yeah, the, the other import company didn't do it yet. So what happened then afterwards, yeah, the Molen had to uh, uh, delete their logo from their bottles when they uh, transported it to China. So you saw in china the molen bottles would then like at the mill the windmill gone just across so yeah and that's the kind of stuff that could still happen in china that's a bit uh, different compared to here so ethics wise it could be sometimes a little bit uh yeah you do whatever you want and uh, they try yeah. to 
to push each other a bit. Happen in, uh, that could also happen, trademark issues in uh, United States and stuff. But is it like if yeah. you go to court in China yeah. for that and you can make your case, is, is the rule of law pretty strict and okay for business? Yeah, it's pretty strict. But in but in that, in, in let's say, for example, in this specific case, it's the way it is that company registers the yeah. trademark and registers the logo. Or let's say, I think it's then for maybe two or three years, yeah, you cannot use it and that's it. So, yeah, yeah. yeah you, you were too late. You didn't do it. And, and uh, yeah, that's... Uh, so then, yeah, then the law is if you register a trademark, yeah, the, the trademark is there and you can use it, even though you're not importing the product. But, there, but yeah, it's not only with beer, it's with other products too. We have those companies who who will do that, uh, who will try to do it with, with trademark stuff. But that's just a, yeah, it's a small example, but for the rest, it's it's pretty okay. The process, I would say, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Okay. Yeah. And then um, what I'm thinking, so you have done all this good craft beer in China, you have a huge access to great craft. Do they start making their own Chinese version of something that is like almost half counterfeited and then filled with cheap beer, but designed like a Western logo? No, 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 I wouldn't say that. No, uh, I didn't, I didn't hear any story. You have the stories about, uh, fake eggs and fake rice it's I, I've, I've read them before it, it's true and it, it happened and, and you have a lot of a lot of a lot of counterfeit there but for beer i would say especially the craft breweries uh, now you have quite quite a lot already and the ones who are really into it they will really try to make their own products and okay at this point like here or like in america ipa is the most famous style so they will especially i think they will try to make the new england the new england ipa style uh within china and okay it's copying but it's it's the way that the european brewery also tries to make a new england style as the americans do it you just try to to get as close as possible maybe it doesn't always always be as good in china because yeah maybe their their process is not so good or their their ingredients are not that good yet um so yeah maybe a, Funny story about about breweries in China is that one of the laws that a Chinese brewery has is um, if they want to bottle or uh, put a beer in cans, they need to get to a, a certain minimum volume, and the minimum volume is actually pretty pretty huge. So what happened in the very beginning, a lot of those small brew pubs or small breweries who just started, yeah, the only thing they could do is put their beer in kegs and then put it in put it in their own bar or their own shop or sell it to some other cities because I think the volume was, yeah, I'm talking about uh, 100,000 uh, liters of beer they need to produce before they could put their beer in a bottle or a can. And of course, afterwards you get, as when an industry gets professional, you get these OEMs who can offer you, you can put your beer in bottles with me in my factory and stuff like that. But in the very beginning it was like that. The bottles and cans was very few. You only had cra uh, draft beer for the, for the craft breweries. Um, to zoom in a bit on that, um, culturally, how does uh, your average Chinese person looks to beer? What do they like? Do they like dark, strong beer? Do they like hoppy, bitter stuff? And what is the difference between, oh, I want a glass bottle or a can? Is a can cheaper than a glass bottle there? Uh, I wouldn't, I mean, can or glass, I don't think they have really have that, like, like we have that perception I hear in Belgium, I know a can, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's cheap supermarket beer, your beer needs to be in a glass. I don't think they really have that tradition because they always had also the commercial ones in cans or in, in, in bottles. So for them, it didn't really, for craft beer, it also doesn't really matter. Uh, what I know is that, yeah. Typically, the the Chinese, even though they like to drink baijiu, which is a strong alcohol, if it's for beer, they on average they don't really look for the very high alcohol. And when I'm already talking very high alcohol, I would say above eight percent, it's already becoming quite strong. So you will have craft breweries who are doing imperial stouts or maybe some porters or some higher alcohol beers. But I think at this point they're still less popular. That's why a lot of the breweries, the craft breweries, if they do IPAs or they will do session IPAs, but even if they do IPAs, it will be always like five to seven percent maximum. I think that's a, especially if they if they can sell a lot of that, that's a that's a good point. 
or maybe some more fruity beers. It doesn't have to be super sweet because typically Chinese in food as well is not that sweet. Um, so in drinks as well, they're not used to, let's say, Coca-Cola even. I mean, they have Coca-Cola, of course, but it's it's not it's not super popular there. So they don't have that really sugar rush like we have. We don't, they don't need sugar that much. So the beers can be bitter. It should be especially easy drinking. I think it's still a little bit from that drinking culture. Easy drinking can be some fruit in it. Um, yeah, I think that's 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 pretty much what most are doing now. Are there many laws that are special for brewers or distributors in China? Let's say you can you can ship alcohol online. I assume in China. Yeah, yeah. I think if 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 the one of one of the things I learned about China and about distribution there, like if you import and then you start distributing, there's pretty much no law. I mean, you can do whatever you want. Uh, the few rules I know is the one I just said for breweries. Yeah, you can you cannot can or bottle a beer if you don't reach a certain production level. But for a distributor, it's not like the American three tier system where importer first have to sell to a distributor and then the distributor sells to a smaller retail shop and then he sells to a retail client. In China, it's just okay. I'm an importer. I can have my own online shop. I can sell to distributors in Beijing. In uh, in Tibet or wherever you are in in uh, in Shenzhen, so you can have your entire network across China. It's possible, so you can sell directly. You can sell to bars, to bottle shops. Yeah, it's it's all possible. So there is no restrictions on that. It's it's pretty pretty open in trade, and and that's why the, the on the other side there's a lot of competition amongst importers or amongst distributors as well. It's it's very competitive, yeah. very price competitive as well. Sounds great. Um, what's the the made in China brand of craft beer? So, are are the Chinese leveling up with the knowledge of craft brewing themselves, or do they hire Americans or people from Europe to brew in their brewery and put their label on it? Or what's the level? No, no, of? no. I think you can. How how it really started, and I think the first ones were. Uh, I would say that the the years between 2000, yeah, I think even 2005 is too early. Around 2010, that's approximate. Around 2010, you had the first really major ones who started, and typically what happened is, or it was a foreigner, maybe an expat or one who was living already quite some time in in China, who would partner up with a Chinese because that's one of the things. If you're a foreigner and you want to start your own business in China, it's not so easy. You always probably Actually, you always need a Chinese partner in your in your uh, in your venture you want to do. So, and that's how 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 most of them started. The, the most famous one, probably, who sold out to AB InBev, is, is Boxing Cat from Shanghai. So it was an American guy, Michael Jordan, not a basketball player, who then started with his Chinese one of his Chinese best friends. They started a brewery that became quite popular, and yeah, then eventually they sold. Another example is Ding A in in Beijing, also a, a mix like. Like in a, I think I think also an American and with a Chinese and that's a lot of them are like that it could be a European or a Canadian or an American that were the first ones and then you also had a couple purely Chinese craft breweries back in that time uh, Master Gao is a famous one and beer from from Beijing is is one of those and they started on themselves I think especially those they they got the experience for maybe traveling to America or to Europe and they, they got into beer and they really liked it and then they start brewing themselves. So typically it's not really about how they're gonna ask an American to come over, brew some beer and then put a label on a bottle. Usually it's a, a foreigner who has already been living in China and he thinks, okay, maybe I want to do something different than my current job. Let's let's do a brewery. Um, and that's how it really started. And then the last yeah five years, we really have a lot of just 100% Chinese in, in, in any city who will start maybe a small brew pub or a small brewery, and then they start to grow. Even though sometimes you have brew, you have Chinese who totally don't understand brewing, but they see business now. Right? It's it's normal if if you see a business growing, a market growing, you always have people who want to jump in the market, even if they don't know, even if they don't know what they're doing. Uh, it's 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 i would say it's pretty easy in a way of equipment because everything is made in china from equipment 
uh, all, a lot of European or American breweries, the equipment it's made in China. It's 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 one of the biggest producers for all the for all the equipment. So for a Chinese locally, it's it's pretty easy and let's say investment wise still low to to start a small brewery because the 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 equipment is already there, the ingredients they can find pretty much okay, and then they can start making some IPAs or some easy lagers or something uh, something easy to sell. Um, is there something typical of ingredients uh, that the Chinese do in their beer in terms of hops, malt? Is there, is there something like a, a Chinese hop or a special herb that they do in it? Uh, I would say for hops, I'm, I'm not 100% sure. They're really like, probably there is some hop production there as well, but I wouldn't say it's it's very, very popular then because I never really read about it i mean especially like i said if they want to do the ipas like americans do they're gonna look for citra or mosaic or simco or whatever they can find because they want to have a, a good ipa what what they do try to do more and more is for example i think the first ones that i mean the first typical one you would find in in a in a chinese recipe for a beer is like the sichuan peppercorns so you would have many many years ago already like some even some European or European breweries would export already to China and then would make a beer specifically for the Chinese market or local ones would also do it with, with those peppercorns to give it a little bit of spicy, spicy touch. Um, or like, for example, in the West of China, you have uh, a lot of uh, fresh food production. And for example, I think like watermelon, especially in the season, is very popular in China as well for, for like maybe a ghost or a, like a, a, a light fruity, fruity beer. And then they can use some watermelon. Uh, I know, I know. I don't know if you know durian. It's a very smelly fruit. Okay. There's even a brewer, a brewery in China who also did it, where they use the, the the smelly fruit in the in the porter. So yeah, of course, they they try to they try to experiment as well, and they try to find ways. Uh, like for example, you have the baijiu. It's also aged in like a sort of ceramic pots. So they put it in caves for a couple of weeks, and like a or brewer. Not so far from from where I lived, who who used then those pots to put in a stout just a couple of weeks because I tasted it and it was the, the taste of the the strong alcohol really came through and but it's it's quite interesting they they do kind of stuff like that. Yeah, is there any um, brewery that you know in China that uh, tries to make Belgium style beers? Is that or is that a hype in China making Belgium style beers? Uh, yeah, there, of course there are right? because and if I think if they they would do a, a Belgian style, uh, the two styles that would pop up for me for sure is on one side uh, like a white beer, wheat beer, like Hoogarden because Hoogarden was one of the, I think the the most popular brands of uh, of of Imbef in China even more than Stade Artois or than Leffe. I think when I when I went to China the first time. You, it was Hugarn, you saw it everywhere. It was really like you had Heineken for pills, that was a, the popular one, and then you had for, for wheat beer because it's a little bit sour, it's easy drinking, refreshing in summer. You saw Hugarn. So that's also one of the, the styles they like to they like to make. Produced and I think the other uh say it again, sorry. Hugarn to produced in China or shipped to China? Uh I think yeah, back then they still shipped it. Uh but I think yeah, also with the Stella, I think yeah. Now for sure, I know they have a they have a brewery, a couple of breweries in China itself. But a couple of years ago, I saw bottles they were produced in in Korea, for example, in yeah. South Korea, and then they imported to to China. Um, but then now, yeah, probably they produce like Stella and Hugar and maybe Hugar and not, but Stella, I'm pretty sure in Korea or locally in in uh, in, uh, in China made. Lefen is always imported. I saw it on the bottles. So, and then I think the other style that's quite popular is is like triple. Because you also have that typical uh, yeast aspect that can play, and I think if they can find the yeast quite easily, they can they can at least make that style a little bit to to the traditional Belgian style. So I think those two, uh, it's also uh, triple is also a, a blonde blonde beer, not a dark beer. Dark beers are sell always a little bit harder in China. So yeah. Okay. What are some of the most uh, noticeable? craft beer brands in China that export also? Oh, that export, 
I would say oh, I have to think. I think at this point there is let's say I don't think we. I mean the most famous one is 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 Tinga, of course, but that's not craft. And that's a commercial one. You will find it here in the Asian supermarkets or or but really craft. Um, at this point, I don't think like to Europe they don't really export. I don't think to America. I mean, we would need there a Chinese brand if you already have so many American brands. I think they try to a little bit maybe to more of the Southeast Asian countries. Yeah. Um, they would try to export maybe a little bit. Uh, but at this point, I think even though if there are some bigger ones already of the craft brewers, they will still focus mainly on, on the local market because, yeah, local market is already quite big. If they can grow there, then they can start maybe thinking about uh, exporting. And if if some of the the ones who would maybe consider it, then I would first think about like Boxing Cat because they're also part of AB InBev already. Yeah. Then you could maybe try to do something and make it marketing-wise interesting to try in Europe. But at this point, yeah. you also have to travel. Like, if you make an IPA in China, it needs to travel for one or two months to Europe. Yeah, then you have a non-fresh IPA, not yeah. so cheap. Why would we need that as well? And, and your own market is... Has, has enough potential to grow so why would you do all the paperwork to ship it yeah to true countries? true yeah. yeah and then you have the taxes and everything so the local market is still growing even though like i said it's very big competition but yeah it's for the local brands the local crop beer brands they can still try and, and increase their their market share for sure yeah um to pick to pick on that so we have china which is this huge hub in asia with a lot of transport and everything is there uh, for the buying then uh, of brands, how does that reflect for the countries around China? Um, a lot of Asian countries around China get their Western beer from China, or how does that go? For example, Hong Kong, a lot of the beers in Hong Kong are bought in China then. Uh, it depends uh, because I have, I have some friends in in Hong Kong, and it's it's it's. It's dual. I mean, I know typically a Chinese importer they won't exp uh, they won't sell to Hong Kong or like Taiwan. That's because they will consider mainland and because Hong Kong and Taiwan they have different uh, tax regulations. Like, so typically in Hong Kong you have importers there because but yeah, let's face it, Hong Kong is a very 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 small market. So you will have some importers and they will do some brands from Europe or from America. Um, but what I do know and what happens is that maybe some shops in Hong Kong, they will buy some beer via Shenzhen because it's so close. So, or yeah. even from Shanghai and then the Shanghai one would resell it to Shenzhen and then the Shenzhen one would resell it to Hong Kong. And then it will travel in a way within Hong Kong, which is, let's call it the gray zone. And then the, the, the beer gets into Hong Kong and it's sold there. It, it happens. I know it happens. And so, but it ho it's, there's also direct import, so it's 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 both both is happening at the at the time. Yeah, and countries around China, let's say uh, Korea, for example. I think I think also because I I know Korea also has a very specific alcohol law about import, and it's a very highly taxed. So I I would not think that Korean importers would import. Western beer from China because it's already imported than within China and then again from China to Korea. I think Korean importers they will directly buy from from the brands they want. Um, and at this point, from what I know, I don't think there's any Chinese craft beer brands exporting to Korea now. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, what do you think that are the main challenges that the Chinese uh, craft beer market will have in the future? All we well, it was a very successful story. Like the yeah, of course, yeah, it's a, it's a huge market and it can still grow. I think a well, couple of the things is yeah, you, like yeah, you don't have the point yet that you have too many breweries because maybe now I lost count, but let's say there's maybe roughly let's estimate between five hundred and one thousand craft beer breweries, and then there can be the super small ones like a, just a brew pub in a small city. Uh, but I think at one point, some of those smaller ones, they will, they will stop, they will stop their business because I think one of the, one of the points in China you need to do is try to scale up. So you need to, to try to get volume and, and 
to make to become really really profitable i know from the, the small bars or bottle shops a lot of them it's just passionate people about craft beer or about beer but i don't think they will make that much money on it because one of the major costs in china is rent so real estate is quite expensive especially if you're in a big city labor is cheap um anything you need for like decoration and stuff that can be pretty pretty okay but it's really the rent and if you don't get the volume then to to get your your profit that's that's the difficult part um what also will happen at one point i think is that yeah some of the imports now some brands will will stop or or some importers will stop for sure with certain brands because like I said, there's becoming too too many brands. It's becoming too much. And now this year has been very special because you had a start of the year looked very good. And then Corona in China happened. So we had that pretty much three, four months for sure, almost no sales. And then a lot of bars and shops had a very big stock because they ordered just before the Chinese New Year. Corona happened. They were three months shut maybe. And then they, they had to start selling their existing stock but you still had those importers trying to get beer, new beers, new brands. It always needs to be new, new, new. Uh, it's it's a very, very, uh, uh, very huge, uh, especially on the beer geeks, is like the, the, the untapped or the rate beer or whatever you call them, tickers. So they always look for new stuff. And that's quite some of the importers are following this trend now, which is not always a good trend, I think. But that's what's happening, and I think at some point this will stop because you will have too many too many options for for a bottle shop, and they don't know anymore what to do, or they will just follow the trend that other shops are already buying, but then maybe the less popular ones will 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 fade away, and and they won't be imported anymore. I think uh, that's from an import perspective, and then from the breweries, uh, I think they can still actually evolve a lot on on quality. There's Pretty much, there are pretty some pretty good breweries out there now. The local ones, they're doing some some good IPAs, some good sours sometimes even some good refreshing sours, some or some session IPAs or easy drinking beers. The stouts is is getting there. It's it's still uh, sometimes a bit watery in in the in the mouth feel, but I think there there is still a lot of potential and a, a lot of the I think if the ones which have the passion to to use good quality to to really know what they're doing know their know their brewing process, then they can they can really become successful. But you will always have the ones who will just start a business because uh, maybe they think it's easy money. But those are the ones in I think in the next three to five years, yeah, they will they will stop uh, anyway. Is there enough quality control from the Chinese government to check um, measurements for hygiene and uh, good sealing of barrels and stuff like that? Uh, you think? <sighs> Uh, I, I I think there. Yeah, I'm, I'm not that much into like really food inspection in China, but I know from when you visit a restaurant or you will see like those typical uh, like we we have those blue those blue papers. There you have these also blue, and then you have a, a smiley in green, orange or red. And if it's a red smiley, it's probably not a very good place. We can still be tasty food, but maybe the kitchen is not very clean. And I think for breweries it will be a bit a bit similar, but I'm 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 not super familiar with that. Um, but of course, yeah, it, it it's it's also a a process of of, of take some time. Like what I know is back in the days, yeah, you had you had these first tap rooms. Yeah, maybe they didn't know about cleaning their tap lines, so you could have beer that's oxidated or that's that tasting a bit buttery because yeah, that just it's not the beer is bad, but it's is is the draft system is not well maintained, but that's also something that's that keeps evolving, and they keep doing their best. Uh, they try to get cold storage as much as possible, or cold cold chain shipments as much as possible, even though it's not always happening. But they, they try to do their best. So that's a that's a good evolution. Uh, will everything be always super clean? No, of course not. It's still a it's a it's a pretty developed country, but it's also still developing. You still have a people who are not maybe used to all the, uh, let's say, hygienic rules like we have, but it's evolving. That's what I can say. Yeah. All right, cool. Um, final question. When are you going back to China? 
Yeah, when are we going back? It, it, it depends. Eh? At this point, uh, we Belgians, we are not allowed to enter because we're one of the countries now on the list who doesn't get a visa. We need a visa to enter unless you're a diplomatic or a politician, you can enter. So yeah, normally we would have gone this year, but uh, yeah, let's let's hope next year if there is a vaccine or if we are allowed to go to go back. Let's say if even if or even if you're a Chinese citizen and you would like to go back now, you always still need to go minimum two weeks in quarantine if you arrive in China. So uh, yeah, if you only have two or three weeks holiday, it's not worth to go back for now. But yeah, as as soon as we can travel again, then of course we will go next year if we can. We'll go. We need to visit the family, visit friends, go drink some beers, go meet some friends, of course. Super important. Yeah. Uh, what can we expect uh, from the bottle shop during the holidays? Hops and hope. Yeah, so what what to expect? Yeah, of course, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lockdown now. So we had a lot of ideas about food pairing, tasting events. So we had a very nice one planned, but it, it got cancelled, of course. Uh, so what we're doing now is we have our we have our Christmas box, so our beer uh, beery Christmas Advent calendar box with 24 nice beers. It's it's I took I, I actually I put a lot of time and effort in it. I, I really wrote down from every beer description, the brewery description. I wrote a beer style description and like a small food pairing just to make it fun and not just uh, I open my yeah. slot of day one and there is a bottle. Oh, okay, yeah. now at least there is some introduction. It makes it more more fun so that's really uh, something we're now for the rest is going to be especially maybe some small gift packages or uh always always a very good selection of new beers it's every week we get some new stuff and it's always always fun fun to bring in and i think that's that's really what will be the the main the main thing for the holiday season will be because yeah with the lockdown can i do a lot more than at least try to bring new beers and give home home delivery service to the people if, if they they don't want to come to live and we bring the beer to you so uh so yeah looking forward uh, to that Kuhn, thank you a lot for the interview and the insights on china's beer yeah scene. thanks a lot for the time and the questions it was quite interesting very interesting and see you around editor you